dear colleague, Joe McDonald, who is the director of the Rock Art Center at the University of Western Australia. Joe has had a long and very, very accomplished and productive history as a researcher in Australia. She, before she became an academic, which she never wanted to do, uh, she was probably the <laughs> most successful and accomplished <coughs> cultural resourcer, consulting archaeologist in Australia, based in Sydney. I've known her for a number of years. I participated in some of her visitors, some of her rock art sites. Uh, she <coughs> has just received a, a few years ago a uh, what they call a futures fellowship uh, from the uh, generous Australian government who supports a lot of archaeological research, not mm. enough as far as they're mm. concerned. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, mm. to study, uh, make a comparative study of the rock art in Australia's Western Desert and the uh, Great Basin. And that's what she's going to talk to us about today. She'll be around mm. for a couple more weeks here. So if anybody wants to talk to her further, uh, let us know. She's reachable by that usual thing, email, um, and she uh, would love to uh, continue the converse with you. And today she's going to talk about basically mm. the Arizona Rock Art uh, Comparative Project um, that she's just been in the field for the month of October in, in the Great Basin. Mm. So welcome. Thank you, Meg. Thanks. <laughs> And thanks for having me. I do love these, um, this, this forum at Berkeley. It's something that I first came to, I think it was over 10 years ago, and I thought, what's a great idea to call, call visiting speakers, you know, brown bags? I think that fits quite well in this instance. So I'm feeling good, I'm up for it. <laughs> and today, as Meg said, I am going to talk about this um, Australian Research Council project that I've been working on now for the last five years. Um, what I'm doing is, is, is basically trying to bring a comparative approach to the Great Basin and bring some of the methods that I've been using in the Western Desert and see if there are ways we can actually think about the rock art here differently. So in a nutshell, um, the project has basically been interested in drawing a comparison um, between the peopling of two empty continents. Uh, Australia and North America, before the arrival of modern humans, were both empty. So these, have both, these large continents have both been peopled by modern humans, and so I'm interested in how people did that in the first instance, how they moved into the arid zones once they were there, and my view is that probably rock art was part of the suite of modern human behaviours that in fact made it possible for them to make that sort of journey out of Asia, across the sea into Australia 50,000 <coughs> years ago, and by sea, uh, possibly by ice sheet, by the land bridge, the, la the Bering land bridge um, into North America. And obviously we don't know exactly when that is and there's obviously a, a very vibrant uh, sort of set of new research agendas that have happened in terms of, of when, when was America first uh, settled by people. So in their paper on uh, human dispersals, uh, Yosef and Belfort Cohen put forward the notion that an interaction between cultural and genetic systems played a major role in hum human evolution and that this can contribute to our understanding of the package of modern human behaviours. So social traits like large-scale cooperation, behavioural norms, ethics and ethnicity. Now Bar Yosef and Belfort Cohen used stone tools as their road sign to identify the teaching and learning systems that they argue must have been in place um, by people in the past, um, to characterise specific social groups of people as they move through Eurasia uh, in the middle and lower and upper uh, Pleistocene. Now, it's patently clear that rock art, as evidence for cognition, uh, with recognisable symbolic systems, provides an even more potent form of archaeological evidence for this type of dispersal. In fact, if stone tools are road signs, then rock art is Times Square. It's a blaring cacophony demonstrating intra and intergroup um, behavioural changes, uh, accompanied by technological innovation and efficient forms in systematic teaching of survival skills. It's true that archaeologists have had to make do with stone tools um, in attempting to unravel the mysteries of how people have dispersed into these different landscapes. But rock art as, an evidence, as evidence for a learned system of perpetual knowledge um, likely facilitated, I think, the colonisation of Australia and the New World. Art as a form of information exchange would have provided a much clearer learning outcome than a core reduction strategy. Um, and it certainly would have enabled the crossing of ecological boundaries in Eurasia with the subsequent migrations into Sahel, uh, Sahel and the Americas. So where have I been and where do I come from to give you this perspective? Um, I've been working in the Western Desert, which is in the middle of the Australian arid zone. I started working there about 15 years ago with Peter Veth, um, and 
a project that we did in the late 2000s, the Canning Stockroot project, formed a lot of the data and provided a lot of the data that I've been using for the last five years for this future fellowship. So I think that arid zone hunter-gatherer behavioural adaptations are key to understanding how the rock art works in this landscape. Um, and we've been modelling, he and I have been modelling how um, this behavioural change, as identifiable in the archaeological record, can be identified in the rock art. So the important take home message from this time series graph, which is, comes from the work of Al Williams and colleagues, is that there are major episodic environmental changes through the 40,000 years that the Australian arid zone has been occupied and, and um, lived in by people. Um, and that you've got these spikes uh, in occupation through time, but that the proliferation of evidence for human occupation is in the last two to 4,000 years. There they are, the last two to 4,000 years. <laughs> okay, we've been dating the rock art. Now, we've, we've targeted the most recent phases of rock art production because they're the ones that have actually got surface pigments uh, in, in the art. And similarly, we get a, a, the same pattern. Most of this art is produced in the last two to 4,000 years. And we've dated sites now from about 35 different locations across the desert. Not only that, we've also been trying to uh, get some, co some correlation between occupation deposits and the art in those shelters. So we've been excavating decorated shelters to try and get this, this shared um, uh, sequential information. And we've got a phased art sequence, which I won't talk about in detail here because we have published it. You can read it anytime you like. Um, but basically this, this model sees um, art accompanying every phase of occupation of the arid zone. I think people used art when they arrived in Australia. I think they were using art when they moved into the arid zone. And then what we see in the, in the arid zone in Australia is this phase change through time, which is demonstrated by major discontinuities in stylistic information in that art, um, which indicates that people are in fact changing the ways they, they use particular locations and they change their relationships with each other at different times, depending on their, their territoriality, on whether it's a, you know, a, a, a wet or a dry period, how mobile they are, how closely they know their neighbours, how, how much they need to depend on their neighbours. So all these things are tied into understanding how people will be living in the, de in the desert, but also what their need is to signal information about each other, to signal their long-term connections and uh, social connections and stylistic connections. And then this has changed through time and we can see quite, this quite clearly in the Australian desert. Now, interestingly, as part of my future fellowship, I in fact went back and, and did some more recording because 800 sites was not enough. Um, and so I focused on this, this particular range, which is in the middle of the Birribaloo native title determination. Uh, we've recorded another 10 of these locations, which are spread around the, uh, the range in a, a quite a different way to some of the arts, other provinces that we've found. But the other reason that I've focused on this particular location is that it is the place where Serpent's Glen exists. So Serpent's Glen is known to the locals as Karnatakul, and the Carnarvon ranges are Kachara. So they, these are the Aboriginal names for this particular landscape, which has been on the map since the 1890s. Now, <coughs> the reason that I was <coughs> particularly focused on going back to Serpent's Glen, Serpent's Glen was dug by uh, Peter Veth and Sue O'Connor in the, in the early nine, uh, late, not late, late 80s, early 90s, I think, a long time ago in prehistory. Um, and when we went back and we dated the most recent art on the wall in this shelter, we found that most of it was created between about 500 and, and 1,000 years ago. Now, when you look at the excavation sequence provided by Sue and Pete's early excavation, you can see, yes, it pr proves that Aborigines started living in the desert 23,000 years ago. Um, there was a peak in the, in the mid-Holocene around 4,000 years ago. But then their most recent dates, their most, their most, um, the largest uh, focus of occupation was indistinguishable from modern in their dating. And so I had a problem with that because our art dates suggested, in, in fact, that the main peak of the most recent um, art production was, in fact, sometime between 500 and 1,000 years ago. So we went back, partly because we also were not able to date this panel, which is a large red and white bichrome panel with um, headdress figures and, and lots of lovely, uh, probably, probably sacra on the board, these large boards which are decorated, which are um, sacred in, in, recent, in recent times. Um, this has got a skin over it, and so we, there's no pigment on the surface. We weren't able to date this particular panel. And so we went back and we've actually, actually excavated four, uh, three, three pits in that shelter two of them directly beneath the panel. And from that you can see that we've in fact revised the sequence 
we now have a really nice spread of dates in the last millennium, when 70% of the occupation in fact took place in this rock shelter. We also have an, a new early colonisation date for the desert, which is around 50,000 years ago calibrated. And we have a really nice um, um, uh, LGM sequence at the same time that they got their early date, so around 25,000, 20, 25,000 years ago, a bit older than they got, not that we're counting. Um, and then of course the same um, mid-Holocene um, a spike as well. So that's really nice. We've now got a really good sense of, of the contemporaneity, contemporaneity between the art production and this really fine set of occupation lenses and things that we can see in that recent period. And we have a, we have a good indication that, that earlier art probably is produced around four to 5,000 years ago, the red and white art, which is something we'd argued earlier in terms of our phase model based on other uh, art dates we got from elsewhere in the stock route. So from there, let's go to the Great Basin. And let's think about what the environment would have looked like when people got here in the Pleistocene, whenever that particular number was. Um, obviously, it would have been a very different environment for the Paleo-Indians uh, who arrived there. Uh, it would have been much wetter than it is today. And I think we can assume that the early art and occupation sites are probably loca located around those large uh, Paleo lakes. But it would appear from the, the, the recent uh, research that people are doing looking for pre-Clovis layers that we could be having to look a lot harder and a lot deeper for that evidence. People are finding that up to five metres below the current surface level is where you're going to find the evidence for the pre-Clovis layers. So that's, that's, that's ongoing research and it's really interesting because when I started this project I thought I was dealing with two totally dis disparate time sequences in terms of America and Australia. I wouldn't be surprised if by the end they're probably the same. I mean, you know, if people came by boat and arrived in Australia 50,000 years ago, there's no reason why they couldn't have walked or go, gone around the sea coast into America. It doesn't make sense. Anyhow, that's another, that's another day. That's for another day. So what am I interested in? Um, part of the reason that I wanted to do this comparative thing is that the ethnography for the Great Basin and the Western Desert are very similar in, in terms of the modelling that was done by early people who worked there. So Dick Gould came to Australia, did a lot of early modelling for how hunter-gatherers moved around the Western Desert. And this was based on, on um, stewards and Julian stuff from the Great Basin. It turns out Dick Gould had never been to the Great Basin before he came to the Western Desert, and it shows, because when you come to the Great Basin from the Western Desert, you go, this is nothing like the Western Desert. It's totally different. High elevation, recent landscapes, totally different in lots and lots of ways. However, it did have the same sorts of local organisation and mobility patterns at contact as, you, as, as we find in Australia. So there are, there are similarities obviously in arid zones and, and I think uh, the fact that the family was the basic adaptive unit, that these units aggregated and dispersed um, based on seasonal variability forms a, a good basis um, for understanding this difference. But also I think work that's been done by the Great Basin scholars in the last two decades particularly has shown great stochasticity in the way humans have in fact behaved in the last 10 to 15,000 years. So I think we have lots of signs there for the sorts of changes you might expect in the art. A number of people have tried to put together models for the Great Basin. Um, these are, are of useful, of uh, limited utility now because they really were based at the time on the data that people had. So Heitzer and Bormhoff's original model was based on what the known chronology and extent of occupation in the Great Basin was. Same with Grant, um, Baird and Pringle. They basically saw there being these um, phase, different, different phases through time. And, but, they, but the interesting thing is that people have always assumed that you could correlate in some way the art with the occupation. So if people are here for 5,000 years, then people have tried to fit their models to that same occupation phase. So there's, there's not anything unusual in that. <laughs> Certainly when you look at Dave Whitley and his colleagues um, model from the Coso range, they've in fact identified using VML a really deep sequence based on 12,000 years worth of um, microdata in these crusts. And they've argued in fact that there's, this is the longest stylistic tradition anywhere in North America. Now obviously quite a few people disagree with that. Um, and I think probably one of the problems with it is that really you have such major evidence for there being uh, major cultural phases and identified changes in tool technology in the last 12,000 years, including the change from the atlatl to the bow and arrow, changes which are seen in the rock art, that it seems unlikely that this is an unchanging art tradition through that entire occupation phase. So anyhow, and, the other, and of course the other major thing to consider is Bettinger's latest, latest book with, the, um, with um, orderly anarchy 
where he sees um, the bow and arrow bringing with it a whole set of socio-political um, changes which should be indicated in the art. The most fundamental of these is the self-sufficiency and economic competitiveness of the nuclear family. So if this is how people are living in the recent past, you would not expect there to be major group identifying behaviour being, being practised by people. Anyhow, let's get to the areas that I've been looking at. So I've been um, looking at, at two different areas. I've been really lucky to have colleagues that work in these areas who've invited me to work with them. Um, and so the volcanic tablelands, which is near Bishop in uh, California, and the Paranagat Valley, which is in near Alamo, two hours north of Las Vegas, um, is the other area. And so I'll be talking about those in, in various amounts of detail today. So um, the Lincoln County Archaeological Initiative um, meant that some colleagues of mine working at ASM did this project for BLM called a three, three ACEC total recordation project. We would never call anything that in Australia. But anyhow, what it meant is that they actually surveyed each of these huge areas totally. So they did 30 metre transects across the entirety of these very large areas and they were between 30 and 40,000 hectares each. Um, and they've recorded everything in them. Um, the volcanic tablelands is an area which has also been uh, studied intensively over the last 20 years. Um, people, and uh, different types of issues, of, uh, obviously management and stuff there. Um, but again, working, I've been working with the BLM and people who've been recording art for the BLM in that, that area also. So I'll start with a, 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 a broader overview on the volcanic tablelands because my work there has not been quite as detailed. It's building again on, as I said, the work of many, many other people who've, who've done lots of excavation, lots of recording work. Um, Gambastiani, Mark Gambastiani, who's now in Reno, who's a Davis graduate, wrote his uh, PhD on the volcanic tablelands. And he concluded that the tablelands were a marginal environment with limited water resources beyond the oasis, which is known as fish slew. Uh, and plant resources are seasonal at best. So ethnographic accounts indicate that this area was a prime location um, for rice grass harvesting um, and the extensive evidence for seed processing is testament to this activity. And what about the rock art? Is this a signal of marginal uh, occupation and unfocused territoriality? Or does in fact the extensive rock art of this landscape indeed tell more, a more complex tale? So what we're, we're doing here, and in fact I've got a, a PhD candidate who, um, who worked with me in this last month in the field, she's at UWA, Luthea Clayton. She's in fact going to run with a lot of these questions, which are really quite prime questions about how art has changed in the volcanic tablelands, using a really high density of rock art uh, sites um, and an, an archaeological record, which is, which is quite detailed. So there's a great variability in site types generally. Uh, we've got lots of house rings, villages, threshing floors, game drives, lots of different types of um, uh, occupation evidence, uh, ceramics, um, lots of um, obsidian hydration zones that people have used around the area, and of course all these, these many, many uh, art sites. So this is a distribution map of, of all the known sites that are in the volcanic tablelands. These are the ones that are occupation sites that have no rock art. These are the rock art sites which have no occupation evidence. And then you have a whole series of sites which have both occupation evidence and, um, and rock art production. So one of the things we're interested in is in fact how those two activities relate to each other. Various people have worked on the rock art, various people have worked on the archaeology, but no one has attempted to actually put the two data sets together. And I think this has got huge potential for actually trying to understand some of those hunter-gatherer um, activities in, in, the, in the Owens Valley in particular. So, what does it look like? It looks like this largely, lots of um, geometric motifs, very, very few bighorn sheep, um, interesting variability. We've, we've, we're, there's lots of interesting variability in the, in the geometrics there. Um, 120 odd sites have been recorded by David Lee and his colleagues with Western Rock Art, uh, and they've very generously shared their data. They've produced a lot of that material for BLM under, under uh, research projects. Uh, and I've started counting some of that material. So at this stage, I've only counted about 17 of their sites, um, but have a large amount of data already and can certainly say a certain amount about what people have been, been doing in this part of the world. Um, a lot of that, as I said, a lot of the art is, is associated with different types of habitation evidence. So there's lots of different types of data that are going to be able to be brought into play to understand what people are doing there. The art looks a bit like this. It ranges from being heavily patinated to less heavily patinated, 
And obviously there's some interaction between grinding patches um, and other, th other sorts of um, productions. Um, and we also have an interesting amount of pigment use. And again, D-stretch obviously is making this much easier for us to in fact see that people have in fact used pigment in a way interacting with the petroglyphs, which, which suggests that people are using these art sites recursively. So they often go back and they actually add pigment to art that's been produced a long time before. And I think this is a really interesting uh, process. So over into Nevada, um, as I mentioned, uh, Alamo is the location. It's the most um, cultural heritage, um, important thing from a cultural heritage point of view is it's right next to Area 51. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually out on a rock art site and a tourist comes on a, in a guided tour, they're usually on the Area 51 tour and they're just tacked on a bit of rock art on the side. Um, but all these people are really keen to go and actually see what they can see over the fence at Area 51 if there are any aliens. They've actually got a highway called the Extraterrestrial Highway, so it's, it's a pretty wild place to work, I have to say. Anyhow, these three areas, as I said, have been totally recorded as part of this recordation project. Um, Mount Irish is 33,000 hectares, and it's between 5,000 and 9,000 feet. Parock is um, the smallest rock art um, assemblage of the three I looked at. Uh, it's, it's actually most of the study areas down on the plain where they're having more, uh, um, BLM was more concerned about this managing the sort of cultural resources that are in that zone because it's being impacted by people camping and whatever. And then Shooting Gallery, which is the, probably the largest rock art um, centre across that area, and it's also a really large 35,000 hectares, um, and similarly between four and a half and 9,000 feet. And as I said, this entire area has been surveyed at 30 metre transects. I actually went with these guys on a couple of days. I surveyed that hill, which is why I think it's important to have it in this slideshow. <laughs> I have to say, in Australia, we never do survey like this. They did their 30 metre transects in the same orientation across the entirety of their study area. We would normally do that hill going around the contours. I can tell you we went straight down that side and we came straight up the other side. And all I can say is I'm glad I can do downhill skiing because I basically used that technique and I didn't find any archaeology. Very odd. Anyhow, they've, they've, I mean, I think you know, it's really interesting. The whole thing of survey technique is something which, which really struck me as being a massively different thing between Australia and, and here. Anyhow, that was not what I was trying to talk about. Um, Lots of work again in this area of people who've been out there recording the rock art, thinking about the rock art, thinking about the archaeology. There have been a few excavations. Um, Heitzer and Hester in 1974 visited Black, Black Canyon, which is, which is just south of Alamo. They identified this Piranigate representational style, which has got, it's got these big anthropomorphs. Um, and it's become, that, that sort of has become a, a, um, a description of, of how people in fact see the art. So that was one of the things I was interested in looking at also interested in dealing with this huge data set that, that was going to result from this, this amount of, of work. So while there were 51 rock art sites which had been recorded previously, and some of these sites have got up to 150 panels, so we're talking big rock art sites, we're not talking about piddly little rock art sites. Um, what we did was mobilise a, a, a set of techniques which were aimed at both harvesting that legacy data, but also collecting new data. And so we used a number of digital approaches to that. Back in 2013, we used old technology, which was the Samsung Galaxy and um, mobile data system as a way of actually embedding our forms on the devices to record it. Um, these days, we use an iPad and FileMaker 13. So it's, a, it's an evolving process and it's, a, it's, a, a, you know, it's an ongoing struggle to try and deal with the amounts of data and the photographs that we generate. So as I said, we've been out uh, for the last month recording art in both of those areas. We thought we'd find, found a broken fluted point. We were so excited, but the, um, the experts tell us it's probably just a biface. But anyhow, we thought, we'd, we thought we'd found something that no one else had found, so that's, that's life. Always not quite as easy as it looks. Um, so as I said, this legacy data produced by multiple people and the Narada Rock Art Foundation and other, many other people who've gone out and recorded these. So we've, we've used that data. We haven't ignored it. We haven't... Um, dismissed it at all, it's incredibly useful. Um, what we've done though is gone back and photographed these sites and actually done a comparative thing looking at the photographs, looking at the legacy data and now have digitised and, and, and entered all that data into a database. And so at the end of that process for that particular report we ended up with 129 rock art sites which had almost 700 panels and close to 7,000 motifs. So quite a large data set to deal with. And interesting because we actually had these three study areas that you could do intra-regional intra comparison uh, as well as the regional ones. 
The whole thing, of course, was linked to GIS, which meant there were all sorts of questions and things that you could ask of that data that you couldn't ask before. Um, this, for instance, is, a, is um, part of the uh, Mount Irish rock art province. All the yellow dots are recorded panels, and then the purple and green um, uh, ones are different types of piranigate figures. So you can see they're, they're, they're not consistently distributed across the landscape. They're um, quite localised, and I think they're, doing, they're signalling quite different things in this art repertoire. Again, um, quite a lot of pigment art, surprising amount of pigment art, but again, I think using D-stretch in the field, so having it, a chip on your camera in the field, and I assume you all know about D-stretch and you all know John Harmon who's here. He's the inventor, he's the one who's revolutionised the way we do rock art. It is, helps your eyes if you can actually see what you're looking at. It can certainly helps your recording if you can actually get, a, get an idea of what's actually there that is almost invisible to the, to the naked eye. So lots of this pigment art, and again, in the three um, areas we looked at, it ranged quite a lot in terms of proportions. So in one area, there was less than 1% um, of uh, the motifs were pigment, whereas in another area, it was close to 20%. So you get intra-regional intra variability, even within a, a single style province. And here's some examples. Now, that's, that you were mentioning to me for, before about the Piranigate figure that was in pigment that someone had seen. This is possibly it. I don't know. It's got a nice little knobs, knobby things at the top and the bottom, but it doesn't really have a pattern. So I don't know if that's the one that your colleague was talking about, but that's, that's the only one we saw that looked like it could be a pigment representation of a, of a PBA. It's not got much of a pattern in it, and it's, and it's a little bit marginal. But anyhow, I think the interesting thing about, and the reason this, I put this slide in, is I think that a lot of, again, with the um, volcanic tablelands, you find a lot of the pigment use is, in fact, picking out detail in previous art production episodes. So I think people are going back and, in fact, reactivating the art in some way with a different technique. So they're using pigment to recursively uh, produce the same sorts of motifs. Um, and this suggests that, you know, that, that art continues to function in some way in subsequent, with subsequent people, though we, of course we don't know what that, why or how that, what that actually means. Again, D-stretch, this was just a, an example of how useful it is with petroglyphs. People used to say you can't use D-stretch with petroglyphs, you can only use it with pictographs. Well, it's not true. Um, here's an example of a bighorn sheep here, which is what you can see with the naked eye, here is what you can see with D-stretch on the camera, and then when you actually trace it, that's the, the sheep that's there. Now, we've got a, quite a lot of these very large bighorn sheep in Piranigat. These are more than a metre in size. Um, they're all in this very early contrast state. I think they're an earlier form of production. I think they probably relate to the large pattern-bodied and, and um, solid-body figures. That's another, another issue again. And here's another example of how useful D-stretch is with the legacy data. So these are using photos taken by Amy Gilreath a couple of years ago. And you can see using D-stretch, you can actually see a huge amount of detail in the petroglyphs that you couldn't see uh, so easily without, without it. Another innovation we've been using is photogrammetry as a way of trying to actually model how the art um, appears on the rock. And this is a, um, just a, feel, a, a screen grab of, of a, one of those being processed with the camera, different camera views of that. And if it works, I've got a little movie. This is the sorts of things we're producing in Australia for Aboriginal communities that we work with as a way, oh, is it gonna work? Hang on. No, it says not available. Oh, that's sad. Oh, never mind. Okay, well, that's okay. So what happens is basically by having created this photogrammetric model, 3D model, it will actually pan across it and pan back again. So you feel like you're walking past the panel, which is a great way to actually, we've done this and fly-throughs and various other ways of actually visualising with, with the glasses and various different things with communities. So people with trad traditional owners, for instance, who are not mobile enough to go out and visit the sites can actually get a real sense of what it's like to be in the site and to actually feel... Um, feel what, what it's like to be there. Anyhow, so with all this data, what have I tried to do? Um, well, I've, I've really been trying to work on how these two provinces fit into a broader understanding of hunter-gatherer occupation models generally. Um, and I've been trying to work out how the rock art might be modelled to both complement the existing behavioural models and indeed provide a more nuanced uh, understanding of people's adaptive strategies for both peopling the Great Basin in the first place and then their subsequent phases of occupation. So people have devised many different foraging models um, based on obsidian conveyancing zones, for instance. Um, and these are obviously more complex than just the distribution of um, identifiable lithic resources. 
Um, but I would ag argue that this, this type of approach to understanding people's hypermobility uh, in the early Holocene could be used as a basis for identifying early Holocene distribution of, say, the, the, um, the Great Basin Carved Abstract, which has been demonstrated in various instances now to probably date to around 13 to 15,000 years ago. Um, however, the model on the right, which is based on more recent language um, information, so ethnographic and ethno-historically documented language boundaries, this is more likely to in fact reflect the distribution of the styles that people were using at contact. So you wouldn't expect that, that people are doing the same thing across this entire desert at the same time through time to be the same. Um, and you'd expect to be able to pick up these different patterns at different scales, I would argue, um, depending on um, what those types of hypermobility models might be. The fact that the majority of Great Basin rock art is geometric um, means that in many ways it's impenetrable to us as etic observers anyway. We don't understand what people were doing when they were creating all these, these types of images. And not surprising, when you start to investigate the nature of that geometric repertoire, you also see that this is not a homogenous thing. So, you know, by saying that 90% of the Great Basin art is geometric, what does that mean? Because, you know, what they look like, and this is, a, well, this is an example of the proportions in the volcanic tablelands, much, a much larger percentage is geometric, and then you've got a lot of tracks. In the Paranagat Valley, about 30%, however, is largely bighorn sheep. So people are doing very, very different things in these different locations, even though they're only separated by a couple of hundred kilometres. And as I was saying, the, the geometrics in these two areas don't look the same. So people are creating geometric motifs in the Paranagat Valley are thinking and doing very different things to the people who are actually creating those same sorts of general class of motifs in the volcanic tablelands. So how do we deal with that? Well, I've started looking at um, the way that people have started looking at, or how people created anthropomorphic motifs in the Paranagat Valley. As I mentioned, Heitzer and, and um, the one whose name I can never remember, Heitzer in 1974 came up with this, this Paranagat representational anthropomorphic style, which included these solid-bodied anthropomorphs and these pattern-bodied anthropomorphs. But they only represent about a third of the anthropomorphs that are actually created in that art body. Most of them are, in fact, these linear stick figures that in fact go much, schematically go much better with in fact most of the bighorns which are also quite schematic. So I was interested in looking at the pattern bodied anthropomorphs um, and, and seeing if I could actually look at stylistic patterning in that which might tell me something about the way that people were using this particular art form. These solid bodied anthropomorphs are actually identified by southern Paiute informants today as water babies and they say that the PBAs are shaman's helpers. This indicates to me from an Australian perspective that, that um, how art is being reinterpreted recursively by people uh, in, in, in social groups in a contemporary context. And I say this because I think that these motifs were probably created in the early Holocene, and I'll tell you why. So one of the things that I did, because we can't date this larger body of art, we've used contrast state of a way of seriating the earliest to the latest types of production. So we've coded things in the database as to whether they're I'll contrast state one, which means it's at one with the rock, or contrast state five, which is much fresher looking. And as you can see from the 1949 graffiti, it's much, much fresher looking than, than the older art. We've then worked out what percentage of the art is in fact created in each of those contrast states. So it's not giving it necessarily any time zones at this point, but all it's saying is, well, how much of the art is created in each of those phases? And you can see that most of the art's in fact produced in contrast state three, very little produce is produced in the last contrast state, so in the time from around 1949 and before that, not much art, and there's in fact more art created earlier on in contrast state one. When you look at the solid bodied and the pattern bodied anthropomorphs, you can see that there's a bit of a shift in that overall pattern, and in fact most of these motifs are in fact created in contrast state two, and then followed by three. So they're slightly earlier than the bulk of the, of the art that's actually being produced in the area, again, with no actual dates to tie these down. I've then done a stylistic analysis looking at how people have actually used these motifs. And as you can see, there's an enormous variability in the way that people have in fact decorated these pattern bodied anthropomorphs. These are just the designs in, t in the interior of the pattern bodies. And then you've got different types of little top extensions, um, which ra range from being just a single line to little knobby things to little things with like woohoos or bird tracks or whatever. You have different bottom extensions, and then you have fringes, which can be at the top or the bottom. 
So these are all things that were able to be quantified, and so I've entered those all into a database and counted them again, measured them, got a sense of the, of the scale of these things, and then looked at the patterning across those four major locations. So the three areas that were studied by um, a ASM for the BLM project, Black Canyon, which is the, is the site type and which is an, a major concentration for production of those motifs. And as you can see, the ones at the top are in fact designs which you find in all four of those locations, but you actually get unique um, designs being located in each of those different sub-provinces. Most of them occur at Black Canyon, which is of course got as probably partly a sampling thing because there are more of them, but I think also that's an aggregation locale. I think people are actually doing different things with the Black Canyon Peranigate figures than they are in the other locations. And then when you look at the, again, that, that, that seriation through time and when they're being produced, you can see that in fact the focus of them has shifted from first of all being produced at Black Canyon to shifting to in fact being produced in Shooting Gallery and, and Mount Irish later. So I think there's a shift in the production centres through time and in fact people are using this as a, a regional signalling system but in fact the way that they're in fact using that system through time is subtly changing. Multiple correspondence analysis, my favourite, um, is a great way of actually trying to find patterns in your data and trying to understand how similar or dissimilar things are. And when you actually throw all this into an MCA and the Cronbach's factor shows that in fact, you know, it's quite, it's statistically viable, it's above 0.8, but you also have um, internal decoration, what hand the atlatl is being th held in, um, and, the, and the decoration um, at the top, and I can't read that anymore, my eyes are too bad, whatever. Anyhow, four of, those, four of those things that I counted are more significant in terms of describing the, the difference in, that, in the assemblage. However, they're pretty much similar on a, on a larger scale. So one way that you can try to explore that further is to pull out the data and to again pl plot it with that area around the origin um, being indicated differently on the different graphs because in fact the scale is different. So in, in some areas in fact it looks like a big circle but in fact the scale on the axis is the same. And from this you can see that in fact while Black Canyon has a really strong core of homogeneous stylistic stuff that there are quite a few motifs that are outside whereas there are other groups and other sub-regions whereas in fact all those motifs are very similar looking. So I think this is again showing that, that the increased um, heterogeneity at Black Canyon is an additional way of indicating that in fact that's probably an aggregation locale compared to these other locations which are people's homes territories. So, it's much too excited, get much too excited about MCAs. Anyhow, the other thing that I think has been really interested about atlatl variability. Now, only atlatls are seen with these motifs here. If you go to the Coso range where you also get pattern bodied anthropomorphs, they're almost entirely with bows and arrows. Mm. So I think something quite different, that's another, that's another question, that's quite a different question. But here they're, they're, they are shown with atlatls. Mm. And if you again look at contrast state, you can see that the way people are depicting the atlatls through time also is changing. So this is again showing that people are, uh, are modifying the way they're doing this. But the fact that there are no um, motifs that, are, that, that, um, that, that have anything other than atlatls, so there are no barrenos, I think in fact that this, this particular type of production had stopped before 1500 years ago. I think there's also a change in the way people are distributing these motifs around the landscape. If you use the GIS and you look at where these uh, motifs are located in the landscape, they're up high, they're in prominent positions, they're highly visible. Um, I don't know if you can see um, my intrepid, uh, my intrepid assistant up high on the cliffs recording pattern bodied anthropomorphs that are way, way above the actual floor of the canyon. Um, a lot of other art is produced down low, lots of bighorn sheep, lots of geometrics in a very different sort of location to that. Um, and again, when you look at the chronological occupation sequence, so what does the archaeology say about the timing for that likely production through time? You can see the majority of the diagnostic artefacts found on the surface, the hydration dates and all that thing, that sort of uh, evidence shows most of the occupation occurred between three and a half and 1300 years ago. However, that most of the pottery dates to the last thousand years. So I think you've got a major shift here in the way people are in fact using this landscape as hunter gatherers. There's a shift in the last thousand years to the pinion juniper processing. People are using pottery. I think people stop producing rock art because they're making pottery and that's the way they can in fact signal information, the same sorts of stylistic information that they're signalling previously. 
and by putting the two together, the two strains of evidence together, looking at um, the general environmental changes through time, you can come up with an explanatory framework for how in fact people are switching between a geometric and a representational um, repertoire since people first started using the desert. Too much information to talk about here, but basically by looking at the different strands of evidence in the Paranagat Valley, I think you can see different phases of art production uh, which, which tie in um, to major occupation phases. Um, and then stylistic changes which can be sh shown also to shift um, with these climatic phrases, uh, changes, sorry, and which can be understood in terms of social shifts which go with those broad uh, environmental changes. So at the end of five years, I conclude um, that there's huge potential in the Great Basin to actually link occupation um, modelling um, with rock art. I think there's, it's, it's, a, it's waiting to happen. It's just, it, it's starting to happen and it's, I think it's enormously um, exciting to think about the amount of data that's there, the amount of information that's there from an archaeological perspective, the amount of information that can be gathered stylistically about the rock art. Um, and I think, you know, this is something that's going to continue to be a, an interest for me, even though this project's finished. Um, but, you know, I think the conclusion is yes, you can do it, and I think there's enormous um, opportunities to, in fact, for other people to, to start dealing with these sorts of questions and trying to understand how rock art can help us have a more nuanced view of what hunter gatherers are, in fact, doing in the Great Basin. So that's it. I've got lots of people to thank in the Paranagat area, um, people who did lots of work, who ran up and down those hills, recorded lots of rock art, same in the Owens Valley. Um, people at BLM, um, uh, Mark Basgool and particularly at uh, Sac State, uh, who's assisted with, with the guys from BLM to get permits and stuff. And of course you guys, go bears. <laughs> That's it, thank you. <laughs> mm. Mm. Pleasure. <laughs> uh, would you yeah, certainly that's work we're doing in Australia already. We're using PXRF as a way of actually looking at um, um, small changes in the pigments. I mean, in Australia, we've got a difficulty in that so many of our reds are obviously iron based hematite. Um, and so is the rock, that we have a lot of problems with the reds. But um, we're finding with the yellows and the whites that in fact we're getting quite interesting signatures in titanium levels and um, different parts in the white, um, which are giving us ideas of where those pigments might come from. Here, I don't know how much pigment there is and I don't know what the locations are. So I, mean, I think that's, a, that's certainly an interesting question to follow and it's really important in terms of trying to understand why is there a lot of pigment art in some areas and not a lot in other areas? I mean, proximity or is it, you know, importance or there are all sorts of reasons why people create pigment art as opposed to petroglyphs. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, where are some of the struggles you've had with using the PXRF on Rocker? Holding it <laughs> against the wall <laughs> for the oh, time. Uh, yeah. Um, there are problems, obviously, with, with the size of the beam and the, and the thickness of the pigment on the wall. Um, look, it really varies in different art bodies. Part of the problem we have in Australia is the development of skins um, over the top, which means that in fact you're being, you're being um, masked by a whole series of calcium carbonates and other things that are actually coming over the top. Um, I actually heard recently um, a guy who used to be at um, Ansto, uh, who's now back in Italy, Claudio Tuniz. Who's a, who's a chemist, or a physicist, I think maybe a physicist, they've just developed a portable XRD machine, which they actually are, it's, it's, it, he says, oh yes, it's portable, it only weighs 50 kilograms. <laughs> well, oh, you can carry it. <laughs> Anyhow, you, you basically can direct it and it will give you a 30 by 30 centimetre scan of the entire surface. And so he's in fact wanting to bring that to Australia 
to do some experimental work on, on what are the actual um, elements that are being used in, in particular locations. I think it's got great potential. I think carrying a 50 kilogram bit of kit through the desert doesn't appeal to me, but um, I'm, helicopters are good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's, a, it's a really interesting problem and, and Serpent's Glen is an exact excellent case in point where it's worked really well because the pigment is quite thick. Uh, but there are other cases where the pigment is drawn or, or much more superficial and in those cases it's more difficult. And again, getting the thing to work all the time is always not, yeah, not simple. Yeah. Christine, yeah. About your shaman figures mm. that you clearly, your, your team has spent a lot of time on, mm. if I'm not mistaken, did I get this, that you think that stopped around 1500 mm. years ago? That it was, and it's quite old, mm. those two bars in the middle, two and three. That's right, in yeah. Where, in terms of patina yes. and wear on the rock. Yeah. So, and then you, you seem to say that it was linked to pot, you think it's somehow linked to this pottery coming in. So are those images turning up on the pottery? And if not, where are the shamanistic images going? Um, I think the interesting thing is that people are still interpreting them as shamanistic images. Um, even though I think they were not produced by the people who are interpreting them as that. So I think that's my comment about the recursive act, you know, action of people in, seeing the art and interpreting it as however, however they like, really. Um, I think people stopped producing rock art in the last 1500 years and, I, and my argument is, well, maybe they're using pottery as a way of signalling stuff about themselves. This is my pot, therefore this is my place, so if you come to this place and it's got these pots, then that's my pot. They're not doing imagery on them as far as I can see. They're not doing bighorn sheep on them. They're not doing a whole lot of things. They do, there are some pot designs which are obviously highly informative in terms of those sorts of identifying behaviour, but in this part of the world they don't seem to be. Um, so my real question is why do people... I mean, I, it's not a question. I, I think it's a reality. Rock art comes in and out of people's production cycles. In some phases they do it all the time. In other phases they don't. And I don't know whether that's an individual, it's probably largely to do with the individuals in the group. Um, but I think it's also to do about, to do with how important it is to in fact demonstrate things about group cohesion. It's a great way of indicating all sorts of things about, about yourself, the landscape, your attachment to it. Um, in the Western Desert, people stopped producing engravings. They were producing pigment art in the last couple of thousand years. I think they weren't producing engravings probably for three or four thousand years. So, you know, there are phases where it was only engravings. Well, that's all we can see that's left now. Um, you know, it's, it's an episodic production through time and it's those major changes in the styles that people are using which are showing us that there's been a major cultural shift, I think. So the Pranagat figures disappear except for John's colleague has found one somewhere, a pigment one somewhere. Whether it's that one it doesn't really look like one to me, but, you know, it could be... You know, we, thought, we thought it might be because it had the little knobs at the top and the knobs at the bottom, but... So they disappear, except in the coso. They go to the cosos and they get bows and arrows, you know. But they're also slightly different shapes and they have faces in the cosos. They actually, the ones in the Pranic Valleys don't have actual anthropomorphised, they're anthropomorphized in that they have extensions at the top and the body which we're interpreting as little short arms and little short legs. They don't have hands like the cosos either, hands or faces. So again, it's a totally different stylistic production. But those are later in the coso. We assume so, because they've got bow and arrows, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Is the, is the contrast dating something that you guys developed, or is that something that's another part of the literature that has a lot of uh, history to it? Because I've, I've not heard of that. It's no. exciting, right? We use it in Australia. It's okay. been happening for the last 10 years in Australia as a way of trying to interpret the Dampier Archipelago um, art. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like controls go on with, you know, like fascination or mm. anything. That's stuff we're working on, and, it's, okay. and, it's, and it is highly complex. We've now got a, a, a sixth class, which is NA. And that's for the ones where you think, oh, it's got, look, it's one here, it's two here, and it's three there. So what is it, you know? I mean, I think there are a whole lot of things at play that we can't disentangle. But the other important thing to note is that Amy Gilreath and her colleagues have, in fact, used VML and dated the desert varnish at Black Canyon. And they have dates of between eight and 10,000. Black mm. Canyon as one of these big aggregation sites and mm. used one set of, okay, so VML or, or, or the, uh, uh, what would you call it, 
not by the state, right? Yeah. And then compared to something on another major aggregation site like China Lake or Grapevine mm. Canyon, mm. and then see like, well, yeah. does the contrast state link up with yeah. the amount dates for a broad range of, yeah. of uh, panels through those massive concentrations? That yeah. Well, I think it, the thing is, you you see these you see this change through time, and you see you see similar changes through time in diagnostic artifact types. You know, you have peaks of things. So you know, it's very tempting to say that that peak of of, of major diagnostic point and 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 obsidian hydration dates correlates with that peak in art production. Yeah. So you know, it's it's a it's a it's a cheeky correlation at this stage, but it's one which I think is worth trying to try and test some other way. I mean, until we can date petroglyphs, which is not easy, it's never going to be easy. Well, that's why I thought that the, the contrast is so clutch. If you could mm. dial that in a little tighter um, and then use it against, you know, the, those three main activations, yeah. like, you could really, yeah. that, would, that would be a real it would be good. tool. Yeah. That would be so fantastic. Yeah. It would be good. That's for next project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Laurie. Just Fantastic. Kind of, yeah. And it and once residences shift out and people are no longer co residing, mm. these pipes disappear. So something uh. so it's happening somewhere else. But it may be worth thinking about bodies as canvases for pigment as well, and that there may be times when the bodies are being marked instead of the landscape and in the Western Desert, that's absolutely true. And in fact, we've had um, traditional owners actually say to us, oh, this motif is the, is the one we put on our bodies when we're dancing the night jar dance. And they'll say, and this one over here is when we do so and so. And I mean, you can clearly see um, those sorts of connections across the different media. So sand, in, this, in the Western Desert, you've got sand paintings, uh, you've got sand sculptures, you've got rock art, you've got... Um, little portable tablets, you've got all sorts of things and people are using all of them in different ways um, and at different times and for different types of long-term effect. So, you know, you actually put on your skin because of your, it's in the moment. If you're actually recording on the art, then it's recording again, something different about that particular symbol and people's use of that particular site. So, absolutely, but that's really interesting. So, African, African skins. Yep. Yeah, right, cool. Mm. John. Matt. Uh, I was just reading an article by Don Christensen, yep. you probably know, from yeah. Western Rock Art. Yeah. And he did a survey of the Mojave uh, Desert, mm. Mojave area, mm. and looked at the time depth, and he, he, gave, he came up with a couple of different estimates for mm. the time depth mm. of the rock art, mm. and the amount of symbols. Mm. And he's a very thorough man, and he's probably seen most of the rock art that exists out yep. there. And when he uh, divided the number of symbols by the number of years, mm. he realized that the rock art must have been quite episodic. Mm. Um, it must have been ephemeral. Um, yeah. it, it had to have come into the uh, um, come into an area and lasted only a few years and then disappeared. Again. Mm. And of course, then it just stays there. So it, in fact, is on the rock, and then you it's on the people, rock. yeah, right. it's on the rock. yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but the people have gone. And I think that's the really interesting thing about potential change through time is that people who come in and use the place after that are dealing with that earlier mm -hmm. material, and they either interact with it or they ignore it. Um, but again, the way they do that, I think, is really interesting. Yeah. He does know a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Meg, yeah. yeah. Building on Lori's, the question I was going to ask was, um, you 
we've got obviously a, a lot of really rich ethnography in Australia. Now I'm certainly much, much less mm. to go on, at least mm. in this domain, um, for the North American Great Basin circumstance. Mm. And while we all know the perils and pitfalls of ethnographic analogy, mm. I just wondered if in doing a comparative study, to what extent what you know so well from the mm. Australian situation has the possibility or actuality of informing Mm. some of the possibilities for more substantive, cultural, interpretive kinds of um, ways of dealing with the degradation of mm. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think the whole question of ethno ethnography in the Great Basin is ongoingly you know, debated. And I mean, the there's a really interesting paper in that recent handbook about the eth ethnogenesis in the Great Basin. And I think I, you know, part of the problem in Australia, people say, oh, you've got great ethnography in Australia. Well, we don't really, because the people we're dealing with on the ground now are probably three generations away from the people who created the art. However, they're still in active cultural systems that are activating knowledge and they are connected to the country still in a way which I don't think people in the Great Basin have been for a very long period of time. So. One thing we did when we were in Bishop is we, we went and introduced ourselves to the Bishop Paiute. And we were advised by our colleagues that this was going to be a difficult process for us. And we said, well, that's okay. We get shouted at all the time in Australia. We're, we're, we're okay with that. We can, we can manage. Anyhow, we turned up at a tribal meeting. And this was extraordinary because it, it's like a, this is like a courtroom. Like it's got the, the board sitting up on a table at the front. It's got people taking notes. There's a tribal policeman at the back. And Lucia and I walked in and we just went, oh my God, what are we doing? We're in trouble here. Anyhow, we weren't. They were incredibly charming to us. They were delighted that we'd, because we basically said, we just are coming to introduce ourselves to let you know that we're here and that we're working on this rock art. And, you know, in Australia, we always talk to the traditional owners. You know, we don't, we would never go and work anywhere or do a project unless we had, you know, community permission. And so, you know, we didn't necessarily ask permission, but we said we're here and we're interested in working with you. And if there's anything you're interested in working with on this art, we'd really like to do that. Oh, that's great. When, when are you starting? You know, it was sort of like, and we'd been expecting a really, really negative response because we'd been told that their tribal, their, their particular person who did heritage work didn't like white people, didn't like women, and didn't like people from anywhere else. So we thought, we classic, we get on all, we're there on all counts, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, I think it is, I don't know how much information is there. I think in Australia, certainly, when I started working in Sydney a long time ago, most of the ethnography that um, I read was in fact what was being mobilised by Aboriginal communities back then. But in New South Wales, it's a very different situation to what the Western Desert. And I think New South Wales is probably more like what you're getting in the Owens Valley, because I think it's people have been moved from where they originally were, where their families originally were. Um, and I think connections are much less uh, tangible than, than they were, and, and they're longer. The dist distance between then and now is much longer. So I don't know. It's something we would really like to be able to do, but I just don't know how realistic it is. Mm. You must all, oh, you've all had lunch. I was going to say, you all must be starving. <laughs> it's late. <Yeah. laughs> That's a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs>